I've learned and I've realized that everybody has a story. If you want to win, you got to gamble. My jovial behavior is to cover up fear or insecurity. What we have is supposed special. to be being able to be yourself, good, bad. You are what you are and who you are. And you can't be afraid to lose in most. Everybody's experiences are different. People realize that I'm just as vulnerable as everybody else. What education does for you is it provides options. I don't think anybody should judge me until they know me. He wants to take the world by storm. Big fat black teddy bear. Cheryl was the skinny black narrow sparrow, and Gwen was the black buckeye bitch. I think what surprised me the most when embarking on this project was realizing just how much of our family history we didn't know.
What we do know is that according to the 1940 census, Matteo and Imelda lived in a rear slave quarter at 1524 North Roman Street. And they lived next door to Matteo's mother, Aurelia Martial Suarez, and his sister, Venita Suarez Sayas, with her husband and kids as well. Although the details surrounding Imelda's birth and childhood still remain a mystery. What we do know is that in 1940, she recorded French as her native language, and she worked as a housekeeper for a private family, but she did it under the table because she recorded zero for her annual wages. Pieces of conversation. What I think I heard said at one point in time that my mother was born out of wedlock and left in a hospital. Now how these people got to her, you know, to take her, I don't know. And her mama, as I think I was told, died in childbirth. So I really don't know how they got her. Uh, I've given that a lot of thought. And there's a lot of information that people don't have about my mother. Uh, my mother's mother died in childbirth. Not childbirth, but she died in, either in childbirth or when she was very small. Mm -hmm. And the cousin, nobody was there to take care of because there was no man. Because nobody, no one said that they were the fault of the child. Okay. I don't know anything about her, really. All I can remember my mother telling us that she died when she was young or in childbirth or something. I'm not sure on that fact. And my mother's mother committed suicide in jail. She was half Indian, three quarters Indian, whatever. And I think she was part Indian. And she had a problem with alcohol. And uh, she was arrested and locked up in jail. And she killed herself rather than being locked up and losing her freedom. She killed herself in jail. Well, my mother was, I guess you would say adopted. I knew there was a lady named Lavinia Frederick that I think was a foster parent. I later on was told that that was a relative of my mother's, not just a foster parent. And I only remember the lady sick and I remember her always fussing at me. I don't have good memories of her. I don't remember liking to go by her house. She lived in a project, but we had to go there during the summers and stuff like that. I was the smallest, you know, so uh, my idea was just stay out of her way. You know, so I don't have very many memories, and certainly I don't have any good memory uh, of, you know, I don't even know what we called her. I really don't. You know, when I think about it, you've asked the question. I, I don't, all I know is her name was Lavinia Frederick. I mean, for many years, we just believed that the lady we called grandma was her mom. And then one day she explained, you know, and I guess she thought we were old enough to understand that that wasn't her real mom, that this was just the lady that raised her. And I'm confused about that fact. I can't remember if it was someone in the neighborhood that her mother knew who took her or if it was a relative. I have no idea. And I never worried about it because I only knew one person that we called grandma. You know, and that's who I just looked at as my grandmother. I never thought about somebody else. I never did. I don't remember that. I heard it as a child, but it wasn't relevant because Lavinia raised my mother, so she was raised to us as a grandmother, okay? On December 20th, 1971, Angelina Griffin swore in an affidavit that Philomene Terrance, Imelda's mother, left Imelda with her and disappeared. Angelina swore that she gave Imelda to her brother, Joseph Fredericks, and he raised her with his wife, Lavinia Fredericks. Her father was uh, half Indian too. He uh, used to hang around on Johnson and Lafarouche, where Smitty's Bar was. 
So, her step parents were not educated or sophisticated people, although the old man wanted to be a pimp. He was what you call a sporting man back in those days. And uh, I don't know whether or not he pimped her as a young girl, you know? Mm -hmm. There's a possibility that could have been it, and that could have been one of the reasons that she uh, was as assertive as she was. So consequently, she was always looking for her father, mm -hmm. okay? And she never did find out definitely who her father was. She had opinions and she had people who suggested who they were, but mm -hmm. it was never confirmed. I can't remember, it was either high school or early 20s when I, I was walking with my mother and we were near a circle food store, and she said, see that man over there? She said, that's my real dad. And I said, why well, aren't you gonna go speak to him? She said, no. And we just kept walking. Then after that, I started seeing him around in the area of the Seventh Ward, but I never went up and approached him or anything. But I figured, you know, if she didn't want to talk to him, well, I would, you know, I worry about <laughs> making an effort to talk to her. <laughs> Well, what comes to my mind about my mother is that she was a strong black woman. You know, my father was the happy-go-lucky person. We could always laugh and play, but mom was serious most of the time. You know, she was responsible for taking care of the house, making sure we had our clothes, our little uniforms when we were going to Catholic school, you know, stretching a dollar. You know, she used to say she could make the buffalo fight on a nickel. She squeezed it so tight, you know, and, and she did. She was a strong, strong woman who had real difficulty finding gray areas. It was either black or white with her, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, she was Miss Know-It-All, Do-It-All. And I don't know, I just think of the safety and comfort I felt with my mother. I think about her being the person who took care of things, like she repaired small appliances, she worked, she sewed, she cooked, she helped, she was the one who helped the neighbors, she was the worker. If the faucet broke, she'd fix the faucet. If the roof was caving in, she'd get up on the roof and put new slates. I don't go that far. I will try to fix things. And if it's something that I buy and have to put it together, I'm okay with that. But my mother would take, you know, wood and nails and start making a cabinet or something. You know, I'm not that good. <laughs> she could make anything. I mean, she painted, she did ceramics, she did um, like figurines and clocks. And I always wanted to know, like, she, I just felt like she could create anything on earth. And my mother believed in taking care of all of your necessities, mm -hmm. you know, that was what was on her mind at all times. How are we going to fare tomorrow? I have to hold it all together to make the family work. I really think she loved a lot of people. She, she gave of herself. And then I realized how much wisdom and strength was in that woman and how she had a close connection to God. We used to say she was like E.F. Hutton. When mommy spoke, God listened. You know, she managed off nothing and we never felt like we lacked anything. It, it was just amazing. How secure she always was, you know, with herself. She just always thought she could do anything, be anything, even though she didn't have a great education. And she always made us feel like we could do anything or be anything. I love the way my mother took charge of things, and my mother could do everything. Mm -hmm. I could always depend on her. I couldn't depend on my daddy to, see, to fix something. My mother would do that. <laughs> if there was any crisis, my mother was the one who took care of it. But I didn't like my mother's lack of affection.
you know, she she was the stern, strict, disciplinarian, didn't take no shit body. And so therefore, everybody saw her as the whole individual. I think about my mother as a stern disciplinarian. She was scary. She used to have a knife that she slept with under the couch or under the bed, and it was a big old butcher knife, and she would like, yielded and I was just always afraid of her if you cross her uh, she was gonna get up in your face about it and if it meant going to Fist City or Knife City or Gun City whatever that's where it was going you know what I mean we clashed a lot <laughs> so she wasn't the perfect mother my mother grabbed me in the collar and put a watermelon plugging knife up to my throat <laughs> and told me, I gave you life, son of a bitch, and I'll take it away. He don't mess with my mother. <laughs> <laughs> one was the disciplinarian. One was kind of like our playmate. I think she was a little abusive at times with her kids in trying to direct us and keep us walking a certain line of discipline. I don't think mommy was abusive. Um, I think she was harsh. I think she was very harsh. I used to say she was my mean grandmother because she used to stay on my butt. Um, I felt the wrath of her, uh, of her harshness at times. Spanky practically every day. <laughs> so. Was that because you never did your work? Yes. Never, mm. practically. Who do you think did their work? Sherry. <laughs> you know, and with her, there was no giving them no ground. She would grab a knife and run outside to fight or stab somebody in a minute. I mean, it was, that was her, you know? Like, my mother's lack of affection. Mm -hmm. My father was very affectionate. My mother displayed no affection whatsoever. I was about to say, she, she had a scary ability to know things before they happen. In her, in her better moments, she would do almost anything to help any one of the neighbors, you know, and beyond what other people would do. Like my mother, really, When my mother made 62, she discovered she had no birth certificate. And she was devastated by that because she felt that she was not even, you know, recognized as a human being because there was no record of her birth. And, you know, we tried to comfort her with the fact that, how can you say you're nobody? You know, you're married, you have five children that love you. You know, you do exist, <laughs> you've worked. But even with Social Security, we had to get people who claimed to know when she was born so that they could create a certificate so she could get Social Security because there was no record of her being here. According to the 1920 Census Bureau, there was a record of a two-year-old little girl named Melda. She was baptized Catholic in 1936 at the age of 18. She went on to marry Matteo Suarez later that year. This information was used to create a delayed birth certificate that proved that Imelda did exist. God, he, the minute he walked in the door, Coming everybody up, started smiling. We get a perspective he he on Daddy's life. Something with us. He was going to take us somewhere. In a lot of respects, he was a much better father than I am.
our show. Wasn't that fun? We're going to be getting back to Daddy in just a moment, but enjoy this family video from a picnic. I was younger, my father was the one who made us laugh. And my father was the one who played games with us. Mm -hmm. My father was the one who, and although my mother did play games with us sometimes, but my father was always the jolly one always he came home and he had all the children gather around because he gave them nickels to go buy a huckabucks and all of the children like the Pied Piper came for when Mr. Mickey came home because they knew they were going to get a nickel to go buy a huckabucks. His whole life still around and having a good time. That's what I saw. All I can remember about my dad is fun. My dad was the fun person in the house because my mother was so serious. So my dad took us to all the fun things, did all the fun things with us, loved to play, loved to joke, gave us the money for the treats rather than to buy our shoes or something. He was just always the fun dad. I say dad was the happy-go-lucky person. I mean, he was the one that took us to the parade, bought us the toys that we wanted. You know, where mother was concerned about us having shoes. I remember one time I told my daddy I didn't want no shoes, I wanted a basketball. And my daddy bought the basketball, and my mama cursed him and I both up. You know, because I needed shoes, but I didn't care about shoes, and daddy said, he was buying me what I want. More in just life, pick up phone. Didn't care about much else. You know, as long as he was having fun and had a beer in his hand, he was good to go. My mother would give you her last two dollars to buy a pair of shoes, but my daddy would give it to you to go to the circus, you know. <laughs> he wouldn't buy you no shoes, but he'd see that you got to the circus so you could enjoy something, you know. While nothing could replace the amazing experience of going to the circus, after all, Cirque du Soleil is one of the greatest shows on earth, Imelda did have legitimate financial concerns. In the 1940s, Matteo worked as a veterinary assistant for only 20 cents a day. He worked a 60-hour week and recorded an annual income of $624. I think about the entertainer, the jolly uh, person who 
gave happiness and laughter to our life. He, the minute he walked in the door, everybody started smiling because we knew he was going to play with us, he was going to do something with us, he was going to take us somewhere. And even if we had been spanked or chastised by my mother, he came in and he made everything okay because he'd start playing and joking with us. In a lot of respects, he was a much better father than I am because he did much more with his children and he shared and he bonded much more with them than I know how to do. Uh, but as a child, there was nothing I didn't like about him, mm -hmm. to be honest. I loved my father. Mm -hmm. Everything he did. I guess as children, we appeared to like our daddy maybe more than we liked our mother because she was always the serious one, you know, and daddy was always happy and laughing. Because he wanted us to enjoy life, you know. My mother wanted us to be serious, identify your goals, stick to your objectives, you know, mm -hmm. boom, 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 boom. And my daddy says, you got time for all of that crap. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> My grandfather was an outdoorsman that, like A.J. sort of, always wanted to be in the woods, hunting and killing something, right? Mateo was the fifth of six children, born November 16th, 1913. His union with Imelda created the first and second generation of Suarez's, detailed here. Little is known about Mateo's father, Luis Domingo Suarez. What we do know is he was of European descent, born in Spain in 1879. He immigrated to the United States and married Aurelia Martial shortly before 1899. On his return from a hunting trip, they were in an automobile accident and he was paralyzed from the waist down. And he came home in the wheelchair and he took it for as long as he could and then he took one of his shotguns, put it up underneath his head, pulled the top of his head off. You know, as he, according to my father, he just couldn't take being confined to a house, a wheelchair, you know. Suicide, he shot himself in the head. For what reason? Because he had cancer. Uh, that he was in a wheelchair and he commits suicide. I don't know if that's true or not. Despite his fun natured personality, Mateo wasn't perfect. Listen to his kids as they describe some of his flaws. He didn't care about housework or what the house looked like. And like I said, my mother did everything. So I resented the fact that he didn't partner her more in that. And he had other women. <laughs> uh, and he took me with him one time that I made a big mistake. I came home and told my mama about it. <laughs> oh, the roof went off the house. Well, my father used to go out with the boys, mm -hmm. okay? And as I grew older, I realized when you were going out with the boys, sometimes you weren't just with the boys. Mm -hmm. uh, he came home drunk. We had the best of both worlds, given the circumstances, mm -hmm. you know. I got the best of both of my parents. I really believe that from the depths of my heart. You know, my mother was a money manager. I'm very good at it. I've always been able to save. You know, that was never a question. My mother used to say, if you make a quarter, you take and spend 15 cents, but you put a dime away. That's the philosophy by which I've always lived. I don't have any financial intelligence. If I have a dollar, I will spend it in a minute. <laughs> you know, they have gotten older, money smart, as they've gotten older, thank God. And some of them I still kind of question, okay? <laughs> well, because we got to see both sides of the coin. The family had not accepted my mother, my daddy's family, right? But 
and they ousted him and, and, and her, and that's how we wound up in that one room. Uh, they wanted their own place. You know. you know, half of my family, my daddy's side, was, I won't say they were passing for white, because here in America they were considered white. If you weren't black, you was considered white. They were mixed with Hispanic. And why would they want to be black? They looked white. Why would they want to be black at, you know, back then, the way they treated black folk? She powdered herself white. And if she walked past us, like on Esplanade or something, she didn't even speak. It was during integration, and she sat in front of the screen, and we sat in back of the screen. I never got mad with him about that. You know, I have a cousin my age. He left here, went to California, passed for white, married a white girl, okay? And it was not until they had a baby in the bed that they had a girl realized something was wrong. <laughs> You know? The hardest time in my life, and it's, it's like it was yesterday, and I'll never forget it, was saying goodbye to my mother before she died. And she said, and she admitted to me, how she resented the fact that I never gave her the love that she thought she deserved, that I loved my father more than I loved her. And I went to see her, knowing that she was going to die. Well, I was my father's favorite girl. I admit that he was the love of my life. But when I went to see her, she said to me, if there's anything you want, take it, because you know this is the last time you'll see me. I rushed her to the hospital many times with the anxiety and the fear that she was gonna die. And on the last time that we took her to the hospital, and they told me, I had said goodbye to her many times. And they told me come in to the back because she was dying. I couldn't do it because I had witnessed my father dying in the ambulance. I was with him holding his hand with my mother and I couldn't go through that again. And I don't because I'm getting emotional. <laughs> I can't talk now. Coming up, things get a little out of hand. And later... Worst time of my life. The most recent. But first, this commercial break. Back in a moment. After 18 years of being utterly ordinary, I finally felt I could shine. I was born to be a vampire. I didn't expect it to seem so... You? I would like to report a crime. crime. The Cohens, they've done something terrible. She's my daughter. Told her we think her has made a mortgage. She was born, not bitten. She grows every single day. Oh my. Maintaining our secret has never been more imperative. What is it out? The Voltori. They're coming for us. Enough people knew the truth. Maybe we could convince the Volturi to listen. The family's, family's in danger. danger. We'll join you. We will stand with you. A lot of red eyes around here. I'll never let anybody hurt you. Welcome back to the Suarez Family Documentary. As you can see, we're all stars in our own right. In each interview, I asked for everyone to describe their siblings as an animal. And here's how they responded. I'd say Matt as a lion. 
a gazelle for Matt. And my thinking is, because you see, a gazelle, no a lion is going to eat his behind. But he will go and take a chance and run in front of that lion and then try to outrun him. That's kind of the way I see Matt. Gwen. <laughs> oh, what a, where do you start? I don't know what to say about Gwen. Gwen would be the monkey. She having fun. <laughs> so I guess a cheetah. <laughs> That's the fastest thing I can think of. Cause she never stops. Sherry. That's a unique little bird. Sherry is laid back. Panda. Yes, panda bear. You know, I think of an elephant that moves slow. Sybil, I would say an elephant. Sybil would be a bear. A big, grizzly bear. <laughs> Lewis. Very reliable. Okay, so that's a dog. What if you don't know the names of the animals, but you can picture them? <laughs> Think of animals. Talana, I told y'all, is a little Persian cat. Mm -hmm. Two nut tail, nose up in the air. Talana's easy. Talana would be a hawk. A cat. Talana <laughs> would be Scar. <laughs> Treaty would Treaty would probably be Nyla. But a lion. <laughs> <laughs> as the animal would describe her as. A lioness, isn't she like very protective of her cubs and very uh, on attack and defense mode all the time? Mm -hmm. That's Trinnell. Tamika would probably be a laughing hyena. <laughs> a wild gorilla. <laughs> they're getting out. Ooh, they're kind of wild and heavy for them. <laughs> Niki would be, uh, not Pumba, Timo, uh, Timon, that was his name. I could describe Kelly as an animal, an elephant for the memory. Tail, tail, tail. Well, um, hippopotamus. Oh, well. <laughs> Most of my siblings or my family members view me as number one, crazy. Sherry, like I said, was a little of the oddball. I called me different. She would cheer like spankings, okay. and we didn't care. Sherry, Sherry was chicken. <laughs> <laughs> no, I ain't doing that. <laughs> Sherry would stop. Oh, Jesus. Holy Mary. Oh, God. And my mom used to say, you can give your soul to the good Lord, bring your ass to me. You know, because she couldn't take it. She would do anything. She'd do our work so my mama wouldn't whip her. <laughs> and Sherry was, no, uh, mama find out she gonna kill us. <laughs> Sherry always just wanted to be mother extraordinaire. She didn't want to do nothing but clean house, take care of babies and be somebody's wife. And she succeeded at that, <laughs> okay? We had had this paper we had to write what I, what I wanted to be when I grew up. And she swapped me <laughs> because I said a housewife. <laughs> and she said, anybody could be a housewife. And I thought, oh, well, that's what I want to do. I want to be married and have kids. But when I grew up, I found out, no, anybody can't be a housewife. Because I've seen some dirty homes and I've seen some bad kids. Sherry is the one who nervously and, and anxiously will just go out of her way and, and she cares a lot. And so she's always worried, always nervous, always looking out for her time. She was the most favorite mom on the block and everybody wanted her to be their mother, probably still do. 
Um, she's very, uh, she's one of the most thoughtful people I know. I wish I had that quality. Two, they view me as a homemaker. They think that's all I know, that's all I can do. Not that, that's all I choose to do. And the only thing I ever fantasized about when I was younger was theater. I would have loved to be on the Broadway stage, dancing and singing. I'm not, well, I wasn't concerned with acting. I loved dancing and singing. And if I had to live a dream, it would be to be on Broadway. Breast cancer is the second most common cause of cancer in women of color, with over 20,000 new cases just this year. So when Sherry was diagnosed with breast cancer, it definitely took a toll on her as well as the family. Before my cancer, I had a very out outstanding, not good, outstanding memory. Now I can't remember yesterday. The worst time of my life, the most recent, mm -hmm. is when my sister called me to the shape cancer. That, that scared the living hades out of my eyes. My first thought was that I would not hear her from her. Mm -hmm. That was my immediate thoughts because everyone, most practically everyone that I have encountered who has had cancer have passed away in the matter of years. And I thought this was another. After surgery and chemotherapy, Sherry's now in remission. It was disappointingly easy because she's here. For all the money we put into you. For all the money I put into you! I guess at some point you gotta cut your losses. You hear that? I'll give you five minutes to escape. If you do, you live. And if you don't, My name is Gwendolyn Monita Maria Suarez Carrion. Gwendolyn Monita Maria Suarez Carey. Her. She and her friends played hooky one day, and they were in mom's house smoking cigarettes. Well, like I said, I was my mama's baby, and when my mama came home, I told my mom, Gwen and Charlie May was home smoking. So she said, what? I said, yep, they was home smoking. <laughs> and on one occasion, 
as usual, Gwen was always doing things that she wasn't supposed to do. She, she was your grandma until she, she got died, okay? And she went out drinking. And she came home and she threw up in the bed. As soon as my mama got out that door, that heifer came and woke me up, shook me up, beat my behind and said, if you tell her again, I'm going to tear your tail up again tomorrow. And being the good sister I was, I didn't want my mom to know. So we took the sheet and wrapped it around the vomit. And we slept with that all night till my mom went to work the next day so that she wouldn't know. <laughs> well, I didn't believe her. So when my mama came home, <laughs> I told my mama. Gwen whipped me because I told her. <laughs> my mama said, you little black eyed bitch, come here. She whipped Gwen again, you know. Gwen got me up the next morning. <laughs> And I'm going to beat you every day that you tell. That sticks in my head all the time, laying there with that vomit right between us. Gwen used to say all the time, but Mama couldn't beat the fun out of us. So Gwen just did what she wanted to do, you know, all the time. Gwen and I would say the hell with it, you know. If that's what we wanted to do, that's what we were going to do. We would do stuff and wouldn't care that my mother would whip our butt, you know, like I said. Gwen just loved going out, having fun, drinking, smoking, being with her friends, much like my dad. <laughs> Gwen is the most outgoing in every sense of the word, outgoing. My mom has been my hero. My mother was a lot of fun when I was growing up. She's, she's fabulous. Self-confident. The person who demonstrated to me from a family, loving, caring standpoint, person that I wanted to be. Because she's the queen bee. The fact that she was caring and she was a lot of fun. Her selflessness, um, I think she's the most selfless person that I know. Loving. She was my companion as I grew up, you know. I think she's tied tighter the bonds of mother-child relationship, sort of like my father did, which I don't seem to have been able to accomplish. Your grandmother worked very hard to keep that family bond. I think she likes attention. Um, she's very, very sociable. What do you think separates so you from the rest of your siblings? My communication skills and my independence. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're independent in their own way. However, their independence is derived from the financial benefits I think that they receive. And my independence is the freedom that I have as long as I have my health. Because mm -hmm. I always figured I can make it without money if I have my health. In the winter of 2001, Gwen was involved in a severe accident in Germany. She was hit by a car crossing the street and sustained a broken neck, leg, and a severe concussion. Her husband, brother, two children, and grandson left to be at her side. For some, it was their first time traveling abroad. But there was no option as the seriousness of her injuries could have proven fatal. But after several weeks in the intensive care unit, she began to improve and eventually made a full and healthy recovery. She commands attention and rightfully so because she's got the most unforgettable personality ever. I have very little patience. She is family first, which is a model that she grew up with and that the Suarez family has taken as their model. Life is about love and family and how you exist from one day to the next and that you have to get everything out of life that is meaningful. She has at least from my point of view, my distant vision, 
the kind of bond between her and her children that I wish I had with mine. siblings. So Sybil is the nucleus, I would say. About my mother, mm, an earthbound angel. Larger than life, powerful. 
outspoken, um, brutally honest, sometimes rigidly unmoving. Born at the perfect time in life. I'm a baby boomer. I was here for civil rights. I was here for the Homestead Act. I was here for women's rights. I was here for black president. I was just born at a great time in life. She has everything that she lacks intact. She makes up for in heart and feeling because although she doesn't always say things in the best way, she always has everyone's best interests at heart and she cares so deeply and so passionately about people. Sybil, the only memory that sticks in my mind with Sybil was when she ran away. Well, my, my girlfriend, girlfriend and I, this, this time, we had $80 between us. We got on a train, didn't come home from school one day, took our little $80 out of the bank, and we bought a train ticket to uh, Chicago. She ran away from home, and she ended up in Chicago. And we met this man on the train who we were talking to. Right. And he was questioning us. We were young. If we had any sense, we wouldn't have told this man nothing about us. We thought she would just go to our friend's house. <laughs> so we got to Chicago and we got off the train and we realized we had nowhere to go and didn't know any place to go. But she went all the way to Chicago. He said, stay there. I'll come and get you. Oh, dangerous situations. But we didn't see it that way. We're going to do and We just told him we were going to get jobs and, you know, we were going to live in Chicago now. And, you know. and in this boarding house where we were living. There's all kinds of stolen shit. We were all scared and worried about her. I said, Stella, we gotta get out of here. You know, I can't afford to go to jail. My mom will kill me. Ready, ready, I got a job. I'm gonna be a waitress at this little, you know, cafe or whatever within an hour. I had men that was pinching me on my behind. One left me a note with his phone number. The other one told me he was gonna wait for me after work. And this is what my mama said. She said, bitch, God say, honor your mother and father, and your days will be lengthened. She said, you can die young. <laughs> You're doing everything under the sun except murder. She said, you're killing me. <laughs> Where the hell are you? So Matt went out there and got her. She said, your brother will be out there tomorrow. Bring your ass home. I ran away too, but I ran away for a couple of hours to a girlfriend's house. <laughs> Oh, I didn't have the nerve to go out of town. That she is very calm and she doesn't uh, let her emotions make her decisions for her. If anything happens in the family, Sybil is the one who's going to keep the cool head and be able to step in and take control and handle things. She used to tell me she used to think Everything came hard in her life. Sybil is, I think, the smartest of all five of us. And I know the rest of them are getting married when I say that. I bought a house. Boyfriend helped me get it. Your mama gave me, I think, $400. I loaned me $400. My mama gave me 1000 I loaned me 1000 That's the way I bought my house. I borrowed, but I told each of them exactly when I would pay them back. And I did exactly what I said I did. I got the house. I had no furniture in it for a period of time. But what I did for the children is that we put a blanket in the front room and I'd get hot dogs because we had no food. <laughs> and we had picnics. It was hard work, but she had success that a lot of people never achieved. But I knew I had to keep the job because I had to have security. I needed to know my children had a roof over their head. I need to know that they didn't have to worry about what to eat. I knew I'd have to have money to send them to college. So my whole young work life was with purpose. She always gave back, spent most of her time trying to help other people. And all of them would be barefoot, you know, eating peanut butter, thinking it was great. <laughs> they don't know why my children love me, <laughs> but they do. At some point she realized she was successful at everything she did. But she seems to have developed this attitude that she can challenge things in business and politics or whatever. And I don't think none of us share that with her. What I didn't realize that my children lived in my world. Kelly was 12 years old and could not jump a rope. 
Because I wasn't jumping no rope. You know, I never bought none. You know, she didn't know how to play jacks, but she could play bid whist. Arrow could shoot pool. They did what I did. They lived in my world. Now, I don't know if that was good or bad. It made them well-rounded, well-educated people, though, because they knew things other children didn't know because they lived in my world. Just oozing with wisdom. I think everyone, everyone trusts her. And um, I remember writing a, an essay about her in school, in elementary school. And it, the essay was, who do you admire most in the world? Because I remember thinking how wonderfully accomplished she was. You know, uh, just everything about her was admirable. Being a single parent was the biggest obstacle for me. I always just felt I'd be married all my life, you know, with a family. I knew I'd work, but I always saw myself as a wife and mother. When that my first marriage crumbled, you know, I was devastated by that. The way I was raised, you know, you don't get married and decide to take a break. When you marry, you marry for life. You know, you grow old together. You watch your children grow up and you have grandchildren. You know, and you live this, this family life. Well, that didn't happen for me because everybody else in my family, you know, had their husbands, their families, you know, and I kept saying, well, what did I do wrong? You know, I, I had a hard life and I, I didn't make much money, to be very honest with you, in the labor movement. At the time, I struggled. I struggled hard all of my life until I've retired. And life for me since I've retired has been unreal, unrealistic in my world. Because it it's been like nothing I've ever experienced. Yeah. You know, when I was a single woman, I always had a boyfriend, right? Now, my children never knew I had boyfriends because I never let any man come to my house or anything like that. But my sisters always knew I had a boyfriend, you know. And they say, oh, you always talk about it, but you always had a man to help you. And I say, damn, Skippy. <laughs> Why would you have a man that didn't help you? <laughs> My mother used to say, it's just as hard to love a rich man as it is to love a poor one. I tried to find the rich ones. <laughs> There's utter just flooding everywhere. There's a mailbox. It goes all the way down here. That's another thing I hate to even talk about is Katrina. Oh, you stop. 
You know, I look at this and I think, how in the world did I survive? What sticks out in my memory, particularly during the storm, was the sound of buildings collapsing and trees falling and that freight train whistle. And it all lasted for six hours. The fear of not knowing if I would survive the fear of not knowing if I would ever see my loved ones again. These are the things that went through my mind at the time. All the things that could put a human being to the test, uh, physically and emotionally at least, uh, happened during those uh, six days that I was stuck in New Orleans after the hurricane. On the Saturday before Katrina, we left and went to Baton Rouge. We were standing with a man who was uh, having a meeting in City Hall, and when that man said he was ordering 10,000 body bags, that, that was the moment that let me know it, it, this was serious. Because when he said he was doing that, I said, well, they plan on having some bodies laying around. Because I really wasn't focused on them hurricane at the time, but after that, that's when I, I just threw some stuff in the car and just left. Oh, God. That's another thing I hate to even talk about is Katrina. When I can't remember, someone called me and told me, have you seen what's going on in New Orleans? Turn your television on right now. And when I started looking at it, as soon as I found out what was happening, I started trying to call home. Um, I really, at this point, had no idea that it was going to be uh, the disaster that it was. That was the closest thing um, to a major catastrophe that happened to us. And all I kept saying is leave, don't worry about anything, just leave, you know, don't wait, leave. And it was a hard, very hard time. Not so much, it was the unknown that I think had everybody just kind of in a tizzy, basically. And I, I guess I had about three or four calls to Matt and Gwen and they were telling me what was going on. We're packing up, we're leaving, we're you know on the road, we're stuck in traffic, we're in Baton Rouge, whatever. And the heat was unbearable. The heat was unbearable. I have never experienced heat ever like that in my life, nor do I ever want to. I truly believe that I was born in the right century at the right time and in the right living conditions because there is no way I could survive uh, that heat. Well, I'll say there's no way I would want to survive in that heat. I'll put it that way. Seeing abandoned children floating by, seeing dead bodies floating by, um, seeing the face of suffering um, on every person that I encountered. That is something that has stuck with me for a very long time. I originally left with my family. We went to Baton Rouge, but my husband came to Baton Rouge about 
three to four hours after we got there. And we weren't married at the time, but we did have a child together. And my dad said, under no circumstance could Mike be in that hotel room with me. But my dad said that was unacceptable. So I packed up all of my stuff and Thai stuff. And we got in a vehicle with Mike and we left and we went to Houston, Texas. And my mom was distraught, I think, that I left. I have mixed feelings about the decision that I made after Katrina of um, leaving. Part of me was happy and felt that I made the, good, uh, the right move because once I got to Texas, um, they were helping out a lot of evacuees. Um, we immediately received help. I immediately found a job. I immediately found an apartment. I immediately put my life back together. Um, and the reason that I regret leaving is because that was when my mom passed away and I wasn't there and I was in Texas. And so I wasn't with her when she passed, unlike everyone else people. I didn't have the same reaction as some people. I can, I remember everybody, you know, being upset. I remember my sister crying and all in a hotel and, you know, outbursts. I remember my mom crying and being so, you know, just distraught over everything. I cried uncontrollably and, you know, got it all out. And then the next day, you know, you just had to start all over again. I was devastated. My life was in that house. My baby pictures, my children's baby pictures, the memories that we had from the from the short years that they had been here prior to Katrina and how everything was left at home. And those things can't be replaced. My 40 some years of marriage, children, separations, uh, everything, everything was in the house. I was devastated, including I lost my car. So it was, it was very traumatic, very, very traumatic. I never imagined them losing their homes and everything. I guess to have lost everything in a storm was was pretty tough. There's a lot of them. The things that someone had given me for my wedding. My wedding dress, my fur coat, <laughs> my, 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 my books, my father who had uh, a library had given me and he broke his library up that I had kept. My mother's things that I had. That's the kind of things that I miss. Not the house itself, but those kind of memories the silver, silverware that my aunt, my father's sister gave me for our wedding. I mean, it was 40, some odd like years old, and still like this. My husband seemed like he was going through the depression a lot worse than... Believe it or not, AJ, Marla's husband, was having a hard time, you know? I don't think he recognized it, but most of us did. I mean, we were kind of worried about him for a short period of time there. Uh, he was taking it a lot worse than what I had, is I felt that I had to be stronger for him. Well, everybody took it hard, but his was more obvious to us as a family than others. You know, it was very traumatic, very, very traumatic. Not to say that it was material things, but it was I thought I had lost all of my memories. But I was really like emotionally unattached to everything I lost. You had to be strong, you had to have control, you had to organize, you had to plan. Because I was didn't dwell on it. It was just like, that's all right, we got it to this, 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 and this now. Seeing the devastation and the debts and everything like that would have gotten to me. And 
I think losing just like they've done, losing friends, everybody scattering, losing friends and family and everything, everybody going in different directions, that, that would have put me to the test. You know, they were frustrated to have to live in such congested, you know, situation. To be very honest with you, all I could think about, because they used to tease me, you know, when my husband and I separated, the kids were gone. You're in this big old house by yourself. All I could think is, thank God, I had this big old house. Girlfriend, we got together 50 some boxes of clothes that we had people donate and uh, cards to Walmart and Target and different stores and uh, Paula's husband uh, paid for a truck to ship all of this to him. You know, I never think about losing everything. That never. It's just agonizing or something that happened. The only thing I think about when I think about Katrina, I think about my mom. I think about it taking my mom. That's what I think. Just the tragedy of Katrina itself, then compounded with the loss of Tibet when this was a time when we were all going to really need each other to pull through, I felt was devastating. And, you know, t -Bev died and I just couldn't be strong anymore and I just kind of lost it. I said, but the grace of God, that would have been me because I don't know if I could have dealt with the pressures. And I think I might have had a heart attack. Officially cried, boo-hoo cried, that probably would have been T-Bev's death. We, we, don't, we, we don't, don't seem to lose people in this family, so that was something that was completely unfamiliar to me and just earth-shattering, this not, um, I still to this day can't believe that she's gone. It's not something out I've gotten over or passed in a sense. So it's not, mm, that has to be the one thing that stands out because still can't believe that it happened. After T. Bev died and I just boohooed uncontrollably because I just could not understand or how things, couldn't see how things could get any worse than what they were. I was devastated. That was a pill to swallow when she did die during Katrina. Um, I think back to when my mom <laughs> I wish it would have happened that the way that it happened because I don't think we um, got a chance to say the things that we wanted to say. We never thought that that would be the last day that we would see her. As a family, we had to pull together um, to create a unit in order to, you would say, survive. I wonder, what, as, with every death, you wonder why her, you know. We all miss her, you know, tremendously. And we often think about, you know, what we did when Beth was here. Remember when such and such, you know. I try not to be sad that we're not, she's not here to continue the memories. I just live on the memories of what we did have with her. She had become like a second mother. And therefore, the loss, in addition to the trauma that we were actually dealing with, was substantial. She was like a second second mom to us. Um, and we all were a very close-knit family, so it was it was very, very difficult to take take her death. Uh, how she was always warm. She had this uh, sarcastic smile when she hears something she didn't agree with. I am instantly taken back to the last conversation that we had uh, prior to her passing away, which was, which was, I believe, and I feel it was her gift to me uh, for the rest of my life. The fact that she took care of 
each one of my sons, Bernal, Adam, and Gary, um, in the nursery like her own. She, you'd walk in there and she'd be holding you, all, you guys and playing with you guys. But she is the only elder or adult to this day who has told me personally to my face that she accepts me for who I am and she has no issues with who I am and that she loves me unconditionally no matter what, regardless of who I love, regardless of who I am. And she told me that um, the day on September 2nd, 2005. She worked hard, very, very hard. And now since I'm a mother, I sit back and I wonder how did she do all the things that she did for us during the course of a day without any help. My mom was pretty much the backbone of the family. She did everything for us and everything for my dad. She was special in every sense of the word. And I think about her all the time. T. Bev was not a sister-in-law, she was a sister. You know, I know my mother loved her as much as she loved us. And she fitted right in. To say her personality was so different when she came into this family, you know, I mean, she just meshed and molded right into this family. I love T. Bev like a sister. I never thought of her like sister-in-law. They became like sisters, more than sister-in-laws. I envy her because there's no way that I can do that whatsoever. A woman who went back to school after having four kids, that was just set self goals regardless, just like my father. However long it took her to accomplish them, she accomplished them. She became someone who I felt very comfortable talking to. The particular instance is I think about when I was pregnant with Taylor and I was so scared to tell her that I was pregnant with Taylor. Knowing I wasn't married, knowing me and uh, Taylor's father had this on and off relationship. And I remember telling her the news and then running and breaking <laughs> camp. So she couldn't get her hands around my neck <laughs> or to get her hands close to my face. And I ran and I went to work. But finally it came around and then she embraced Taylor. She embraced the pregnancy. Her and Taylor would do things together. Um, and so it, it just became the best thing afterwards. And... Uh how good her and my uncle were together. Her and Uncle Matt, I mean, it just seemed like a, a good blend. And I used to like to see them together. Just... It's strange that we just clicked from the first night we met. And we enjoyed the same things. We liked the same things. We had the same opinions, you know, about 98%. My mother, they said every good man is a woman behind him. And that would have to have been my mother because my mother was just as strong or if not stronger than my father. Because you have to be strong to put up with my father. So that's why I would say my mama was probably a little bit stronger than him then hang in there with him as long as she did. <laughs> we were a couple that did everything together and we enjoyed it. You know, we loved it. We loved being with each other all the time. And so the day she died, I can recall that morning, you know, she was still making his breakfast, fixing his food, getting his clothes ready to put on while we were out there. And I remember this vividly. He just seemed happy as I, I can't tell you. You know, he called a pudding. Or... We worked, we woke up in the morning together. We worked all day together. We went out to dinner together. We went to the movies together. We went to plays together. We took vacations together. We did everything together. 
those loving little nicknames and all, like she was gold to him. And I always thought, man, that's how you're supposed to love a woman and that's how a woman's supposed to love you. They always seemed happy. Like you get a love of a lifetime once in your life and that was it. I think as they got older, my mom was just like, oh, forget it. And <laughs> she was like, I'm tired of catering to your daddy. And I, I, to this day, still dream about her. And during the day time, I miss her. And I think in a way it's a curse of some kind. Katrina was an experience for all of us and it was a learning lesson. The lesson I think the family learned is that all of the things that had been accumulated, you know, from the family, uh, their homes, their jewelry, some of them, their monies was locked away. All of a sudden, you know, even though you had it all, it could be wiped out just like that. Francisco Suarez Jr. Matteo, Matteo, mm -hmm. Matteo, as I call him, but his name is Matteo mm -hmm. Francisco Suarez mm -hmm. Jr. Originally, that was his birth name. He right. changed it to Matt mm -hmm. Suarez, which I do not recognize. Office, and when I ran for public office, I uh, had an experience with a lady that she says. I, I told her I was campaigning for the state House of Representatives, and she said, well, who is this Mexican? <laughs> oh, oh, I have a problem. <laughs> and so I figured if I shorten it to Matt Suarez, mm -hmm. I might, you know, influence more black votes. But for the people who weren't closely following the election, and only heard the name, 
they would think I was Hispanic, you know. Mm-hmm. So for that reason, I changed it. Plus, on uh, the voting machine, you have to put your full name. So I would have had to put Mateo Francisco Suarez Jr. Uh, okay. You know. We share very little as far as beliefs because he's very, you know, proactive as far as government and all of that. I'm pretty much, if it's not happening at 21490 Powers Avenue, I'm not that interested. Matt is the idea man and the, the innovator. He wants to take the world by storm with his business ideas and make money for his family and Matt would always have all kind of ideas and schemes to make money okay and he would just go out there and try it sometimes fall flat on his face and he just get up and move on okay and most people and I think that's true in the family this is where I, I'm different from them uh, they're afraid to lose anything and that paralyzes them from doing a lot of stuff. And he said, oh, well, that didn't work. Try something else. He's running again. Matt, older, so wasn't, I mean, I, you know, being a young, young little kid who kind of just was with all the rest of them, so he didn't kind of more. It really wasn't around Matt as much as, as like they were being older. Now, Matt and I are kindred there. Matt never wanted to work for anybody. He always wanted to be his own boss. I see him as a strong entrepreneur. I think I admire all of the things that he did as a young man. Uh, he was always very independent. Um, I love talking to him and I, I just enjoy him. If you remember the story of Mississippi Burning, when uh, they taught him feather, these three kids in Meridian, Mississippi. Well, that was the office my brother Matt worked out of. And for a period of time, you know, because white folk was acting crazy back then, they snuck, as I understand it, they snuck them out of the city, my brother and some of his workers, but we hadn't heard from them. And my mom didn't know if my brother was one of these people that had been killed, taught in feather. And, you know, I didn't know if she was going to survive that. I mean, she was going crazy and understandably so. Uh, and I think that experience affected her so much that even though we all lived through that civil rights era, she didn't want, you know, me, certainly not me. And I don't think, you know, she was crazy about Gwen or any of the rest of us participating in demonstrations and things of that nature because, uh, you know, and I, I can understand that. You know, when you don't know if your child is alive or dead because you don't know where they are, you haven't heard from them. But that's the one thing, you know, I remember that my family was totally distraught about. A hero in my eyes because of everything he did with the civil rights movement. What about Matthew Flucky Ball Suarez? I see him as a very strong-willed person, a leader not a follower and under no circumstances he's going to follow he pretty much is a leader and not a follower so in that sense i've taken a lot of his characteristics but he's hard working he's dedicated he loves his family personality is he's just a ball of energy i would say strong someone who seems like they never gave up and still hasn't given up. He is not afraid to do the right thing, as we know, with the civil rights movement. And I think for a while he had us thinking when we were younger and the news people came over, we thought we were famous and we were going to be rich. And I think he sold me a dream that I'm mad about today because I am broke as hell. <laughs> Uncle Matt always wants to know what's on the other side of the hill. That's what I think about when I try and describe Uncle Matt. He is never satisfied with just climbing. He 
is never satisfied with just reaching the summit of a mountain. He wants to know what's on the other side of that mountain. And he's going to do whatever it takes to get to the other side. Someone who you could tell just from talking with him and if, and if you ask him certain thoughts, if you get his feedback on stuff, someone you could tell who's acquired a lot of information, who has learned a lot. You could tell he's been through the struggle. He's no-nonsense kind of guy, or straightforward with everything he says and does. It's pretty much his way, no way. And over the years, I think I've kind of picked up a lot of those traits from him. Uh, someone who has set goals and accomplished them, maybe not in the time frame that he wanted, but someone who never gave up on stuff and someone who wanted better for him and his family. And I, I feel that my siblings and I were very blessed to grow up with that type of father figure in our lives. I'm really glad when Matt took the position that we were going to start a family legacy and he created this logo, you know, and we started doing the whole family bit, you know, and we worry now because the family is getting bigger and we don't want you guys to lose track of each other. And that's very important. If you're going to have a family and a history that everybody can know, you know, and love who they are and where they come from, we just have to begin from somewhere because we didn't have very much background information. Because there's so many families that you hear have a lot of problems, and we fortunately are able to resolve our differences or understand the differences and still continue to move on in a positive light. And you cannot project your experiences, your life, and your whatever onto somebody else and expect them to be like you and because they don't think like you or don't react to things like you, don't act like you, then something's wrong with them. Life is too short to do anything but be happy. And I try to stay happy. Uh -uh. Come on, keep the energy up. Ooh. So it's the secret that's been pent up inside for years. Exclusive type, only for your eyes and ears. You held it in for so long, you burst it in the tears. The letters spill slowly across the page like a world premiere. We're lying. Grab the bullshit begins here. The obvious cause, the effects is unclear. The punishment for crimes of the heart could be severe, though the key <laughs> While on the surface, it's all turning to Oh. 
turned out to do it all over again. Thank you. Why? Hmm? Why? Because you ruined the scene. No. If you throw this, I need to take it. No. You can just leave it there. I don't want you to do that. I told you what your job is, to stare and look mad. at the camera. <laughs> I think people realize that I'm just as vulnerable as everybody else alive. It's so much. I mean, I know you're really gonna have to edit this one. Um, I guess the third person, hmm, Montel. Yeah, if I had to choose a third person, it would be Montel. Physical would be her, <laughs> can I say that? She don't see why she be honest. <laughs> Her boobs, they're like, wow. Okay. <laughs> you seem wow. so cold. A town relationship for the most part. Got to cut that one. <laughs> My perception of how they were raised when I was growing up was that they were rich and kind of snotty. And then as I got older, I was like, no, they not. We were both the oldest, and um, so I think that we sort of, when we argue, when we, Stop doing that. when we... Me and my sister didn't get along. We 
dirty, she had a rum, I was dirty, she was clean. I was neat and clean and she was messy Marvin. So she was an introvert, I was an extrovert. She was thin, you know, I was skinny, she was a little overweight. And like I said, I was young and naive and I was a, I had a lot of book sense, not a, quite a lot of common sense. <laughs> I have no desire to be addicted to anything but sex, probably. I was teaching in an alternative school, and um, <sighs> they say I have middle child issues. Are you going to make my sister or brother mad at me by these questions? Mm -hmm. What am I self-conscious about? We're all big bonded and big hipped. <laughs> yeah, big hips. Oh, oh. If I did, I'm not going to tell you what it was, so. <laughs> Trinell. Trinell is finally coming, in my opinion, I should say, coming into her own, being her own person.